You may take your seats and to those, to our family who, was what, who is watching us online this morning, I want to greet you in the wonderful name of Jesus and welcome you to our service this morning and I'm sure that you are going to be blessed by the things that I'm going to share with you this morning. They are very powerful things, I've never shared it this way, but I feel this morning that it's necessary for me to share the word of God with you the way I'm sharing it this morning. Now, the first time we find God making a sacrifice is in the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis when he kills a lamb to clothe the nakedness of Adam and Eve. The first time we see communion in the Bible is in the book of Genesis chapter 14. The first time we see tithing in the Bible is in the book of Genesis chapter 14. Tithing was before the law. Malachi was not written to the church, was written to this corrupt Levi Levitical priesthood. We will deal with that next week because I'll show you why you tithe from a point of blessing than from a point of a law. So tithing was before the law. Both these sacred ordinances of communion and tithing were took place with Abraham as the and the priest of the Most High God called Melchizedek. The Lord Jesus reveals himself twice at the tithing and communion. And this morning as we partake of the emblems of the broken body and the shed blood, he will reveal himself if you listen to me carefully this morning. Now in Malachi chapter 3, you find everybody and preachers, and preachers, all, over the, preachers all over speak about Malachi chapter 3 as being the tithing chapter. Yes, it is tithes and offerings, but you find that immediately after that, that there's a, the Bible speaks after tithing, a book of remembrance that will be written. Prior to that, God speaks about, and He says to the children of Israel, He says to them something that is very, very, He says, you have spoken ungodly things to me, and you have said to me, for us to serve you, it is unprofitable. For you to walk into church and serve God, you are saying it's unprofitable, but you need to understand you have been saved to serve. You cannot take this for granted. And this is what the children of Israel said. We, you say, they say, God is saying to them, you say to me that to serve you, God, it is unprofitable. And they say to God, you have made us more as mourners than people that have profit, but that God turns around and he looks at a remnant, the remnant who fear him, and they listen to his voice. And notice what it says here, something that is absolutely profound. They listen to his voice and this is what they say. Those that fear him, and they're speaking to each other, and God listens to them and God hears them, and he says, because of you who fear me, not only fear now, but who listen... And hear my voice, I've written a book of remembrance concerning you. And the book of remembrance is this year, that on the day I make my jewels, I make them my jewels, I will open the book of remembrance. There's a book of life in heaven. There's a book of remembrance in heaven. At the white throne judgment, well, there's another book of your deeds of evil. But at the Bema seat, there's a book of remembrance. Of all the good things that we have done, and one of that is tithing. You never believed it that way, but that's the truth of what I'm sharing with you this morning. Now, the bread that we drink and the blood that we drink this morning, Jesus said, as often as you do so, you do so in remembrance of me. Both tithing and communion are eternal memorials. That's why your great, 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 great grandfather who comes from the slaughter of the kings in the valley of Shaveh, meets Melchizedek, and next week I want to deal with this, who has neither beginning nor end, but a priesthood forever after the order of Melchizedek, of Jesus Christ himself. I believe Jesus appeared in a theophany before his incarnation to Abraham, and that's why Galatians 3.29 says, If you are Christ, then are you Abraham's seed, and he is according to his promise. Now, your great, 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 great grandfather, 
gave his tithes to Melchizedek. Melchizedek, or Melchizedek, immediately op- brings bread and wine. There's nobody else in Scripture that brings bread and wine but Jesus himself. So who is this Melchizedek? Like unto the Son of God, he's like Jesus. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace, King Nebuchadnezzar said, and I see one likened unto the Son of God. How would he know the Son of God? That's Jesus Christ in the theophany appeared to them in the fire and prevented them from being burnt. This morning I want to deal with communion. This is called your miracle meal. Remember this forever. It is a meal of champions and a meal for victors. It's a covenant meal of the greatest and most powerful king of the universe that instituted the meal for you. It is a blessing meal. It is a healing meal to the children of the covenant. If you turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 16, it says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So both the bread and the cup are for your blessing. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 23 to 34. It goes like this, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Malachi chapter 3, in remembrance, the book of remembrance. Do this communion in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Not his resurrection. As often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me, Proclaiming the Lord's death. We are proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes. Let's go on to this thing. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, another translation, unworthily, will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man and a woman examine himself or herself, and so let him and her eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he or she eats and drinks In an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak, many are sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we will not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brothers, my sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come to you. Now, we can take the scripture and misinterpret it based on the fact of the way we think. But Jesus said, yes, often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. You're doing this remembering the Lord's death till he comes. Notice he doesn't talk about the resurrection. You will do this in remembrance of me, remembering my death till I come. Why is he talking about this? Till he comes. He knew he's going to rise from the dead. Till he comes. He knew he's going to rise from the dead. Why death? Because when Jesus said, it is finished, tetelesta, tilio. When he said, it is finished, it is done. This is what he meant. He meant for now into the ages and generations to come. What I've done through my death will still be available. The efficacy of my broken body and my shed blood is still available for your sins past, present, and future simply because I am victorious Christ. Nobody could die for you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Mm. He goes on to say, Whosoever drinking unworthily eats and drinks 
in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And whoever eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks judgment to himself. Another translation says damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Two words, unworthily, the second word, discerning. This is why many among you are sick. Many among you are sick, and many among you sleep, and many sleep. Now for a Christian, a born-again believer, and I don't like to use the word Christian now, but I want to use the word believer, those who believe in Jesus and those who appropriate the word and the principles and precepts of God's word, to a believer, a believer never dies. Because to be absent from this body is to be present with Jesus. A believer... Immediately that his spirit leaves the body, his, his spirit goes and returns to Jesus. I'm talking about believers. I'm not talking about professing Christ, but not being a believer in his word. I'm going to come to a lot of truth right now as I share this word. But notice something he says here. There's many sick among you and many sleep. Many people die before their time, he's saying. You die before your time. Why? Because of two words unworthily, and not discerning the body of Christ. Now, we need to understand there's a physical body of Jesus, and there's a body of Christ. And as I researched the topic, I found that you die physically because you don't discern the spiritual body. Let me say it again. You die physically because you don't rightly discern the spiritual body. Now, not to discern the body of Christ, you are... In other words, you're bringing judgment to yourself. Let me show you something. You can pray all you want to pray. You can fast all you want to fast. You can intercede all you want to intercede. But if you don't get this right, you're going to have problems with your prayer life and problems with many aspects of your life. So you better listen to this very, very carefully. He says, now the background of this, the Corinthian church conducted, conducted themselves in a very unruly manner. It's just like some of the churches in the world right now. They were abusing the Lord's Supper. The word discern in the Lord's body is a positive principle. If you rightly discern, you're not going to get sick, or even you will, you'll get healed, and you won't die before your time. If you rightly discern. But if you wrongly discern, and if you unworthily do it, there's consequences. But many have taken that to the extremity and says, if you've got sin in your life, then you mustn't do this at all. Who doesn't have sin anyway? If I had a mechanism to withdraw from your mind every evil thought that you thought in 24 hours, then none of us are worthy enough to partake of the Lord's Supper. Am I saying the right things? Absolutely. What is discernment? The word discernment is the word dicrino, which means to separate, to distinguish what is proper from what is not. To distinguish what is proper from what is not. And a lot of people wrongly discern the things of God out of the skew mindset of insecurity, the skew mindset of insecurity, the skew mindset of rejection, and the skew mindset of inferiority. I am created in the image and the likeness of God. I couldn't save myself. That's the reason why God sent Jesus to die in my stead. I'm unworthy to die for my own sins. I am not the Lamb of God. That's why the precious, pure Lamb of God had to be slain before the foundations of, of the world. And Peter said, we've not been redeemed with corruptible seed like silver and gold. You can't buy salvation. But the precious blood of Jesus. All the good works and monies that we give and all the things that we do for people cannot save you. It is only the blood of Jesus and the finished work of the cross. Now to discern means to, is to see the distinctness of the bread and wine against the ordinary use of it in daily life. There's a distinction between bread and wine that you use normally, but when you come to the communion, there's totally different order and authority, and there's an efficacy that's attached with the, symb the symbols to what Jesus has done. Let me show you. There are two segments of believers in the Corinthian church. The wealthy and the poor. The wealthy came in, they had their communion, and they didn't wait for the poor people coming in later on. That's why the Apostle Paul says, wait for one another. 
tarry and wait for each other. Don't come in here and do what you have to do and walk out. Now, you know the Corinthian church, even though they had the gifts of the Spirit, but they were sinning, they were fornicating, they were committing adultery, they didn't walk in love. And Paul is writing to them about the love walk. He's talking about them about government and order. So if you know the backdrop of this thing, then you'll understand why he's saying what he's saying. He says, if you're hungry, eat at home. They were consuming the wine in the church and getting drunk. Thank God we don't have too much of that here. Somebody said true, and I hope you're not doing, doing that at home. So he said something that's very powerful. He says, you hungry, eat at home. This is the body of Christ. New Creation Bible Church and family who, you are, who are watching us online, you are the body of Christ. Christ died for the church. He gave his life for the church, the body. Jesus came to give his life for his church. We need to tarry and wait for each other. There's no wealthy and poor in the body of Christ. We are one body. As I was writing this thing, man, I prepared three messages on communion and all the two are in my, in my iPad. And last night the Lord said to me, I want you to minister. This is what I'm ministering to you right now. And then he said to me, I mean, he said to me, this one, two, three, four, five powerful words. And I want you to go home and think about these words. We cannot segregate in the church. One word. Number two, we cannot separate in the church. He said we cannot isolate in the church. We cannot differentiate in the church. And we cannot terminate in the church. We are one body. The meal was for all those who accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Why are you segregating? Why are you separating? Why are you isolating? Why are you differentiating? Why are you terminating? Because you can't forgive and you can't love. Am I saying the right things? Oh yes, you may not like what I'm saying, but it's the truth. We we'll try to reason and logic Use reason and logic why we try to justify our unforgiveness and our lack of love. That's why it's a, I always believe this. Forgiveness is the greatest thing. The more you can forgive, the more you can love. And sometimes God has to hurt you more to change you to love. He's got to hurt you with circumstances and situations in life to change you to love. Because you'll never know true love until you hurt. God so loved the world. That he hurt Jesus so much to carry the sins of the world upon himself when he died upon the cross. That's the reason why he says, if you will not forgive your brother their trespasses, neither will your heavenly father forgive you your sin. He hurt Jesus. Jesus didn't want to go to the cross. But he said, not my will, but your will. Your fa the father's will concerning your life is more powerful than your own will. The will of the Father for you to forgive is more powerful than your will to resist it and to use reason and logic to justify it. The Father's will for you to love, the agape love, to love the unlovable is greater than your own will. That's why it's going to hurt you to change you. I will never forget when I started the ministry. The Lord said, I'm going to hurt you to change you. I never knew what hurt was all about. I grew up in the church. I'm a church boy. But look at how people live and how they hurt you. The criticism, the judgment, and people closest to you hurt you. Building the church, I was hurt. I thought I was going to die. But God preserved me and protect me. That's the reason why I'm appreciative and grateful. Don't build your life around a human being. Build it around God. When human beings fail you, God will sustain you. God will preserve you. God will protect you. God will shield you. God will deliver you. God will heal you. This meal was for all those who accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Unworthily, discernment we've done. I'll come back to it. Unworthily. Tell me here this morning who is worthy. No one. Those who are watching online. No one. Why? So to eat and to drink unworthily. Another word is meaning stop judging other people in the body and the church as if you don't have sin in your life. Stop judging and criticizing other people in the body as if you don't have sin in your own life. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what he's saying. 
Man, this is going to get deeper and it's going to get very quiet. When you judge and criticize, you are wrongly discerning the body of Christ because his body was broken for them as much as his body was broken for you. His blood was shed for them as much as his, body, his blood was shed for you. Am I saying the right things? Oh, yes. Because mercy triumphs over judgment. Could you imagine if God judged us, he would never die for you. If he judged you, he would not love you. Every time you criticize and you judge, you're saying you need to love more. I don't hold anything against anybody. Even if they hurt me, they come and tell me sorry, it is fine. People in the church told me sorry. People outside, I don't, I don't hold anything against anyone. But you need to understand the, the order of honor and respect. He says if you, in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, if you confess, not if you hide it. So people say, well, you don't have to say sorry. Well, you have to say sorry. Because you're not confessing what you did wrong. If you confess your sin, then he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. But if you don't confess it, then that's the converse of it all. Let's get deep into this. I like what I'm talking about this morning. The bread is the body that makes you one. If you wrongly discern the body of Christ and you judge and you criticize, then you're doing it unworthily. But if you don't judge them and you realize why Jesus died for you on the cross and you look at your own self and you say to yourself, well, listen, I need cleansing myself. I can't pick on somebody else. Immediately, the power of healings and miracles and breakthroughs and signs and wonders enters into your being immediately. Therefore, many among you are sick and many of you die before your time. Because you wrongly discern the body of Christ and you eat and drink unworthily. Let me go back deep, deep into this thing. There's no category of sin. Sin is sin. Just because of the, I'm the pastor, you won't accept me. But you can't accept somebody else who sinned. The same sin. That's unworthily drinking and not discerning the body of Christ. What is the foundation of us coming together as the body of Christ and eating the meal. The foundation is righteousness. How do I know that? 2 Corinthians 5.17 God made Jesus sin who knew no sin that we could be made the righteousness of God in Him. So I don't come to have the meal because of my own righteousness. I come to have the meal because of His righteousness and what He has done for me. I remember His death Till he comes so that I could be clean and pure. And every time I think a bad thought, I use the blood of Jesus. When we come together and we have communion together, we're remembering his death and what he did for us. Don't get puffed up. Don't think that you're superior because you have knowledge. Because knowledge will puff you up. Just because you have knowledge of the word doesn't mean to say that your heart is right. It's two different things altogether. Because your heart is your attitude and your character in God. Judgment comes out of your mental acumen where you look at people through evil eyes. That's the reason why your mind has to be renewed with the word of God constantly. And you have to see through humble eyes. Somebody say amen. Jesus' body is going to be preserved. Why his body is going to be preserved? Simply because he's the ultimate sacrifice and the supreme sacrifice of humanity. It's an eternal memorial that you're participating in. You do so in remembrance of me until I come. He knew he's coming back. Remembering his death till he comes. Every time we have the meal, you do this with a heart of humility. And a heart of appreciation. Let me explain that. Because you need Jesus to cleanse you. I need Jesus to cleanse me. I need Jesus to heal me. I'm thinking about myself right now. You're thinking about yourself. We do so with humility and appreciation. When you do it with humility and appreciation, that makes you worthy. Amen, somebody? When you do it with humility and appreciation, no pride now. What's the opposite of humility? Pride. When you have pride, you judge and criticize. Every person who judges and criticizes its pride. Decrino, discern. Accurately discern. In other words, distinguish, the, know the difference between the proper thing and the wrong thing. The proper, the proper. He doesn't use the word the right here. He says the proper. The proper thing, proper way of doing it. 
not thinking that your works can save you, but he made me righteous. Now, there are three reasons why we have communion. And after I share these three things quickly, I'm about to close and we're going to have communion together. Three reasons why we have communion. Number one, we commemorate in remembrance of Jesus. Now, the Passover was instituted by God to be a memorial to the children of Israel as they came out of Egypt. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper as a memorial for our deliverance. Watch this now. From sin, sickness, poverty, and premature death. Let me say it again. Sin, your deliverance from sin, sickness, poverty, and premature death. Every time I have the bread and drink the wine, it reminds me of the sacrifice of the cross. I'm commemorating His death for the cleansing of my sins, healing of my body, the breaking of poverty, and me not to die before my time. Somebody should put your hands together and give the Lord a clap offering right now. Number one, I commemorate. Number two, I anticipate. What am I anticipating? I will, Jesus said, I will not drink of this cup or the fruit of the vine from now on until, excuse me, I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. We, he says, in other words, we're looking forward. He set it upon the earth and He says, I'm going to drink it anew in my Father's kingdom. I'm going to be anticipating the great reunion of my disciples and the believers when I shall drink it in my Father's kingdom once again. He knew, He knew. There's going to be a great union. So we commemorate, then we anticipate. As often as you do so, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. Till I come. He knew He's coming back. We anticipate His return. So in other words, we're looking forward to celebrate Him with Him at the great banquet feast in heaven one day. Somebody say amen. Number three, we participate. We commemorate we anticipate and then we participate. We are believers. We are united together corporately. We affirm our faith together. We celebrate the completed work on the focus of the unity that Jesus has given us as the body of Christ. And we declare to the world the only way of salvation is Jesus because He's coming back to receive His church. So we commemorate, we anticipate, and we participate together. Now in this same chapter as I researched this last night, I wondered why Paul is repeating himself so many times. I never read it this way. I said to you, I prepared two other messages, but the Lord said to me this one. Five times in the communion passage, the Apostle Paul says, believers, and he used the word, come together, come together, come together, come together, be one, be united. Like the Lord united us with our sinful nature to the cross. Unite everybody to the cross. When we come together this way, we become one with Him. We commemorate a, the past event. We anticipate the future, but we participate in the celebration as we join hands together and we are united together. Somebody say amen. So could you think of it this morning? What judgment, criticism, unforgiveness, and a lack of love has done to the body of Christ? We can't come together. Anticipate means to look forward to His return. When we commemorate right and anticipate with expectancy, then we celebrate the Lord. This even though we're doing it and remembering His death is a celebration of His death that I don't have to die in my sins. I'm going to heaven. Oh, I would have got excited by now. Some of you not, but I would have got excited. When you celebrate the Lord, you celebrate the forgiveness of sins. You celebrate His healing. You celebrate His miracles. You celebrate His breakthroughs. You celebrate His power. You celebrate His presence. You celebrate His glory. Come on, somebody. You celebrating what the Lord can do. You can only celebrate without despising others and thinking superior of yourself. 
You can't think superior of yourself. My faith did not get me where I am simply because the Word of God says I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I even now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I don't even have my own faith. The faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave His life for me. So I'm living the life of faith. It's not even my faith. Even though I study the Word of God, I spend time with the Word of God, but it's not my faith. It's His, his faith. And my faith is based on all what He has done. My faith is based on what He has accomplished. My faith is based on who He is. And even though I'm used so powerfully under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, it's not my anointing, it's His anointing. The anointing is not about who I am. The anointing is, who he is, is about who He is and what He can do. Look at the wrong discernment that we have. That's why we do it unworthily. I want to know why it's happening. When I pray, when I pray and God answers my prayer, I don't tell everybody, you know what, it's my prayer. No, I'm telling you the God, the God who answered the prayer. Because if I gloat about my prayer, then I'm not praising God. That's the reason why David said, oh man, David says it's so profoundly and so powerful. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty who has answered my prayer. He's giving the blessing and accolades and achievement and praise and honor to God who's answered the prayer. What if God didn't answer your prayer? Your prayer would be futile. Don't take glory when it's not yours. Don't take praise when it's not yours. Don't take faith when it's not yours. It's the faith of the Son of God. It's the prayers that's answered by the Son of God. Jesus answered our prayers. Some, of, some people say, well, you know what? I took my time to do this. I used all my time to do this to, for you, Michaelan, and yet you're still behaving badly. Think of a God who left his heaven, his oneness with God, who lived in eternity, and he came into time that is lower than eternity to come to die for your sins and to save you and to deliver you. Nobody can equate that. Nobody can equate number one. Nobody, nobody. Nobody can equate the praise that we offer to him. He is everything. When I began to study this, I began to understand why we must live a life of thanksgiving and appreciation. And let me close by saying this here. Get ready with that new song. Why we must live a life of thanksgiving and appreciation. I said this many times and I'm going to say it again. Thanksgiving without appreciation is like response without responsibility. Let me explain. You're saved. You walk into church. Somebody taught you you got to lift up your hands, so you lift up your hands. Somebody told you that you need to sing, so you sing. Somebody told you sometimes you need to dance, but some of you dance maybe once a year or once in five years. You have thanksgiving, but you have no appreciation. Thanksgiving is this year. You remember what he did, but you show no appreciation to serve him. You show no appreciation. You find a reason why you can't do things for God. Then find every reason why I should do it. You have no appreciation. I'm talking to all families right now. Stop standing in the way of your husband serving God. Stop standing, standing in the way of your wife serving God. Stop standing in the way of your children serving God. Get out of the way because one day God will hold you responsible for standing in the way. Thanksgiving without a response without responsibility is like Thanksgiving without appreciation. When, when you thank the Lord for what He has done, you serve Him. So one of the statements that we'll push in this church, we are saved to serve God. Every single one of you can serve God and those who are watching online can serve God. You can do something for Jesus and stop preventing people from serving God. We can speak the word of God. We can teach the word of God. Jesus died for his church. Stop separating. Let me go back and say what I have to say before we come to communi communion again. We call not to segregate. We call not to separate. We call not to isolate. We call not to differentiate. We call not to terminate. He gave me those five words as I preached, as I spoke this word to you. 
Because that is what the Corinthian church was doing. And after he speaks about communion, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, then 11, 12, he speaks about the gifts. And then he says, you made your only gifts. And then he comes to chapter 13 and he talks to them about the love walk. Though I speak with the men, though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, and hath not love, I'm become a sounding brass and a tingling symbol. Do I have the gift of prophecy to understand all mystery and knowledge, and have faith to move mountain, and hath not love, I am nothing. When we separate, when we segregate, when we isolate, when we differentiate, when we terminate, we're not designing the body of Christ. When I went to Dr. Cho's church, man, all these things coming back in my life right now. And I know God is about to do something that is absolutely amazing in my life personally and this life, the church of this life and the next church I'm going to start. I know God is going to do something very, very powerful. I can sense it in my body. I can sense it in my spirit. I can sense it that's arising on the inside. I remember God said to me, go to Patmos. I found the quickest way to go to Patmos in February 2016. I took a speedboat to get there in 45 minutes from one island to the next island. I got there and I didn't even know why I started crying. The minute I got off the boat, I got on, the, on Patmos and I started crying. I never knew why I was crying. I get into my hotel room, I'm crying. I go to the monastery of John, the revelator, that loved disciple that you couldn't kill. And I'm crying. I don't know why I'm crying. Then there was a, a stall as high as, this, high as this building here, right at the altar where John prayed and got the revelation. was 22 carat gold plated. And I remember the guy said to me, you cannot go there. I said, sir, just give me a minute to go there. Watch my back. If anybody sees me, this is illegal stuff, but I'm doing it. I crossed the barricades and I went in there and I just stood there awesome presence of God John Anthony will remember he came with me because John spoke about the love of God and the love of Jesus that's why you couldn't kill him he lived a full age ripe old age he didn't die he didn't sleep prematurely he finished everything that God wanted him to to finish and see the revelation and get everything for the church and the end time church lying flat on the carpet here and the Lord said to me go to Dr. Cho that was in June I went to Dr. Cho I remember very clearly I said God but he won't receive me but he said on the 25th of July I will see you I will never forget that day when I walked in for 45 minutes and I sat and I spoke to him he says you have a vision that you have not shared with anybody it's a big vision he taught me the power of seeing the power of faith the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of a dream and how it comes to pass. My precious moments, I will never ever let go of. All that came because of the cross and surrender to the cross. John speaks about love. When I went to Dr. Cho's church, I saw how people care for each other. Here's the point. How they care for each other. How that body becomes one. They never break the lines on the outside. They stand in order. Such government, such respect for each other and, and people in the church. They will not even speak evil. Amazing, 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 amazing. Then when I went to, Doc, when I went to Apostle Maldonado's church, I saw the miracles for three days, I cried every night in my hotel room. 500 supernatural miracles, creative miracles, and three days of crusades, heart transplants supernaturally by angels, cancers and tumors, people getting off the wheelchairs, cripples are walking, blind eyes are seeing, deaf are hearing, the mute are speaking, incurable diseases are healed. If we rightly discern the body of Christ. They have communion all the time in the church. And I saw the love of God. 
And Apostle Maldonado, the first time I saw him at a distance when I walked front to meet him and thank God for Pastor Nikki. Apostle Nikki introduced me to him. He just caught me and he kissed me on my cheek and he said, I knew you coming. The second time he meets me at the corridor, he doesn't even know me. The second time he meets me at the corridor, that was in February, in somewhere in, uh, in July, somewhere again, uh, July somewhere, I, I went back to, to the meeting. When I went back to the meeting, he saw me standing there on the side, on the corridor. He look, looked at me, caught me and kissed me again. And I knew who my spiritual fathers are. And I respect and honor them. So I'm saying to you this morning, when you rightly deserve, I saw the love of God in that church and I saw the miracles that will take place. They don't break orders. They don't break ranks. They don't speak evil against each leader or the leaders. We need to stop all this kind of stuff and learn to respect and rightly discern the body of Christ. And when we do this, right, and we come together as the body of Christ, as one, we don't do it unworthily. We don't do it without discernment, but we do it with the proper discerning of each other that we have been saved by the same Lord who died for us on the cross. We are one. We are one family. The greatest family is not your biological family. The greatest family is the family of Jesus. You should clap right there. The greatest family is the family of Jesus. Because the Lord said this. The Lord said, Whosoever does the will of my father, the same is my brother and the same is my sister. You mean more to me than my brothers and sisters. Biologically. Because you are here with me. I meet you every week. I don't meet them every week. We need to get our priorities right here. And our thoughts are right here. So that we understand why Jesus is making this so important. Because there's an eternal meal that we're going to participate in one day as we commemorate today. I want you at this moment to please stand, sing the song for me one time and let's partake of the emblems. was broken for us so that your body can be healed every time we come together as the body of Christ let's come in unity let's wait for each other let's participate as we're having our family meal together when I was raised as a little boy mom used to always set the table that was six o'clock the whole family will gather together at the table we will all sit together we will all eat together then we could go out and do whatever we wanted to do. This is how he brought us together, the family meal, that we would have this meal together and be, be one. Mothers can bring you to make it one or they can separate it. So it's the mother's duty to bring us together. Food is ready. It's, it's supper time. We all need to sit together and have a meal together. And my father said, come on, Leslie. It's supper time. The school work stops. Everything stops. It's supper time. Television stop, everything stop. It's supper time. It's family time. It's the meal that we bring that brings us together so that we can stay together. It's not only praying together that makes you stay together, eating together also can make us stay together. Because we have fellowship around the meal. That's why Jesus said, as often as you do so, you do so in remembrance of me. We're remembering the Lord's death till he comes. As you hold the bread in your hand, I take authority this morning over every sickness over your body. I command cancer to go. I command growths to go. I command high blood pressure to go. Sugar diabetes to be healed right now in the mighty name of Jesus. I take authority over every sickness in your body right now and I break its power over your body in Jesus' name. I command that acne to leave your skin right now 
eczema to go in the mighty name of Jesus deafness to go your blindness to go in the mighty name of Jesus I speak life to your body right now in the name of Jesus you are healed by his body you are healed by his body being broken Isaiah says he was wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquities the chastisement for our peace was upon him and with his stripes what is about his stripes there's an inscription in the stripes that you are healed from every sickness you are healed he inscribed in the stripes in those stripes your healing and your victory so as we eat this morning we are healed in Jesus name amen come let's partake together His blood has the power to cancel every sin. His, uh, his blood has the power to destroy every work of the devil. Paul writing to the book of Corinthians says, If the princes of this world had only understood and had a thought and revelation and knowledge that if they crucified Christ, what they were getting into, they would have not done it. But thank God that they were blinded they were blinded that when Jesus died, he's going to, when he dies, he's going to shed his blood and his blood will obliterate and cancel and atone for sin. And that's the reason why John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Old covenant, so it's the blood of goats and bulls and sheep and oxen. They sanctify to the purification of the flesh. How much more Christ who through the eternal spirit Gave his life once and for all to sanctify us. Oh man, I like this here. From dead works to life. From the conscience of sin to be liberated. I don't care where you've been, what you've done. The blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. Purifies you this morning. We cross the bloodline from natural to the supernatural right now. And we are healed in the mighty name of Jesus.